Um, so we have, we're on now to um, our fourth seminar, fourth session, uh, philosophy of nature and metaphysics. Let's take a look at our roadmap here. So um, three sections, really mainly two, and then a little supplement at the end. We're going to cover philosophy of nature first. We're gonna look at what nature is, what the causes are. Uh, if we remember from, from the epistemology portion, Aristotle says that we think we know a thing when we know its causes. Um, so what does that mean? What are those causes? We're gonna revisit that. And we're gonna talk a bit about motion and time and get to those um, paradoxes of, of Zeno. And we're going to get into metaphysics, introduce the subject of metaphysics, what, what that means in discussing uh, what it means to talk about being as being. And then the concept of substance, the notions of actuality and potentiality, and then a bit about the causes of being, because that also goes into metaphysics too, um, which turns it into a kind of natural theology. Then we're also gonna talk about modern science, look at a bit about the scientific method, how that differs from the other modes of reasoning that we've looked at, and um, some of the modern challenges to classic metaphysics. Um, and uh, maybe how we can answer them. <clears throat> so we're gonna jump right in to our uh, first reading here. Our excerpt from uh, St. Thomas Aquinas's commentary on Aristotle's physics about the subject of nature and about what nature is um, and what's natural, what doesn't, count as natural uh, for Aristotle. So um, any, any ideas inspired by uh, the questions here or, or by the readings, any of the questions you wanna tackle here? About what, what's, uh, What's Aristotle's, maybe what's, we can start with what's Aristotle's definition of nature? A way of acting. Okay, it has something to do with, with acting. Um, what else? He says it's um, nothing other than a principle of motion and rest. That's and right. Exactly. So a principle of motion and rest. Um, uh, and then he adds a, a qualifier there. Yeah. In that which it is primarily and per se and not per accidents. What does that mean? What's this distinction about per se and per accidents? Per se is in and of itself. It says on the footnote, right? Right, that's right. Accident means it just happens to be like a musician would be that, you know, you're, you're a human being, but you're, you don't have to be a musician. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a human being first, but I'm a, uh, I'm a, a musician per accidents. But if I talk about myself, from the point of view as being a musician, say I say I'm talking about myself as an organist. <clears throat> um, an organist is per se a musician. Okay, an organist can't can't be a not, a not musician. So that's part of what it means to be an organist. So we're talking about something. Nature has to do with things that are um, in and of themselves, uh, in in their own. In, the, in their own being, they have a principle of motion and rest. So what, what, is that, what does that mean? Maybe we could talk about how that contrasts with artifacts or artificial things. Any ideas there? How about the, the knife example? Uh, 
if I say it's natural for a knife to fall, is that because of, uh, of the fact that it's a knife or, or something else? Is it just a fact of knives that they fall? Artificial things are, um, lack that inherent um, movement and rest, that ability to move and rest and artificial, yeah, artificial things are moved or rested by some sort of outside entity. All right, so what, what about an artificial thing gives it its, its uh, principle of motion and rest? If it's not, if, if a knife doesn't fall per se, what part of it um, makes it do that? It's substance, the fact that it's made of iron. All right, great. So it's material. So um, there we can point to a natural thing within the artificial thing that gives it a principle of motion arrest. So if we, another good example might be if we take a look at, um, uh, we'll see on a, on a slide later, we'll see a log cabin. All right. So a cabin is, is an artificial thing, but it's made out of wood, right? Now that wood, um, suppose that's, uh, especially suppose that that is uh, untreated wood, then it's going to rot, right? But that rotting isn't caused by, um, uh, that principle of change isn't caused by the fact that it's a cabin. It's caused by the fact that it's made of wood. So this is a, an important distinction here is that um, nature pertains to uh, things that are not, um, that are not man-made, things that are, as we would say, in nature. Uh, so what about this, um, this discussion of, um, uh, the, the doctor, is it natural for a doctor to cure himself on Aristotle's reckoning? This part of the discussion is a little bit tricky to follow. Um, but if you think of uh, somebody being cured, you have a doctor and you have somebody being cured, right? Right. And it's, if it's a doctor being cured, that's just an accident. It could be anybody being cured. Exactly. Exactly. So if you have a doctor um, curing himself, that's the doctor curing himself per accidents, all right? Um, it's not necessary that the person being cured and the person curing be the same thing. So, um, uh, so what, what Aristotle is doing here is drawing another distinction in saying that even though the principle of change might seem to be within itself, if it's in itself per accidents, like a doctor curing himself, then that's not natural. Um, uh, on the other hand, by analogy in other places, Aristotle will use the example of a doctor curing himself as an analogy for nature. So that's not what, what he says is natural, but it's, it can be kind of an analogy for nature, all right? Um, <clears throat> All right. Any other any other questions or comments on on this part of the uh, the reading, John? How might you distinguish between nature and essence? Are those terms synonymous? Uh, well, that's a that's a, a very good question. I think it will be good to circle back to that when we get to essence a little bit later in the presentation. So um, maybe. Uh, Keep, keep that question in mind. And when we get to that, um, bring it up either then or at the end. And I think we'll have a, we'll be in a better place to, to look at that. Okay. Let me ask a question on the doctor again. Suppose the doctor uh, is cured by the, something within his own body. You know, his, his white blood cells attack and infect him. Mm -hmm. Would that be considered, that would be considered nature. Yes, absolutely. That would be that would be considered nature. But um, then again, uh, it's per accidents that the one being cured is a doctor. So um, he's being cured not insofar as he's a doctor, but insofar as 
um, he is a human person. So that would be natural. That's, a, that's an excellent distinction. <clears throat> Great, okay, I'm gonna um, bring my screen back up. So nature as a principle of, of motion and rest or stability. Uh, and we look at this as, as a, an I, enduring identity with, which persists through the change. So if we think about different kinds of motion and change, um, uh, something coming to be something else, uh, a great example here, an acorn becoming a tree. Okay, there's a kind of, we, we can recognize an identity that stays the same all the way from the acorn in the beginning um, until it becomes a full grown tree, um, right? So that, that enduring thing which brings about that change, which draws it towards a kind of maturity is its nature. It doesn't cause that change in the way that something is forced, but uh, by, by drawing it towards it, by drawing it towards a completion. All right, let's look at another kind of, of change, a chameleon changing color, all right? So here, unlike the acorn, it's not something that's growing to maturity, but it's, it's changing an attribute of itself in, in a natural way. Um, okay, but the nature is not in the color, the nature is in the chameleon. The nature is in that underlying thing, that underlying substance. Um, so an, an animal coming to be or passing away, okay? So here we have some stages of, of human development, okay? Um, and these are snapshots along the way, but this is, this, these are snapshots of what is, what is one sequence of, of motion or change. Uh, and when we get to motion, we'll see that Aristotle thinks of this in a broader way than we do, not just change of place, which is what we usually think of motion to be, but also thinking of changing of a, of a quality as well as a, as a motion. Okay, uh, coming to be, we can talk about two ways of coming to be. Absolute coming to be, coming to be full stop, this means a thing itself comes into existence, all right? So a person comes into existence, that's absolute coming to be. But when a person acquires some quality or, um, uh, or some other change that doesn't uh, change really what they are, that's a qualified coming to be, okay? That's what we'll see later is accidental. Aristotle identifies three different principles of nature. First, we have matter. Um, I have some, some vacuuming happening in the hallway out here. I hope it's not um, uh, coming through. Uh, okay, good, all right. So principles of nature, matter, form, and privation. And these three things are required, Aristotle says, for, for nature. I'm not gonna rehash the whole argument here, but. Let's explain what they are. So the matter is some underlying stuff that is in potency to that form we're talking about. So if we're talking about a human person, then the matter um, we could say is going to be the egg and the sperm, okay? So um, with respect to a person, those things are the matter um, for coming to be. Now the form, what it is coming to be, it's coming to be a person, all right? Privation is the lack of the form um, with respect to this matter, okay? So in a certain way, the egg itself is a fully formed thing. It's its own thing. With respect to a formed person, it has privation with respect to that form. Uh, and we'll, we'll clarify this a bit better when we get to the four causes soon, um, how matter is relative to a certain form. Are any questions on here before I go on? Okay. 
I have a question. Is there the difference between? Oh, sorry. Could you say that again, Jerry? Uh, can you go back to the other, that other slide? They could use potency and potential are not the same. The acorn has the potential of becoming a tree. I know. I'm, I'm basically using those in in the same way. Okay. Well, then, then my question is this. Um, the egg isn't a pot isn't a person in potentiality, is it? Or in, in not on its own. Not on its own. Okay, so it's as I'm struggling is the difference between the egg egg that is unfertilized and the acorn. Mm -hmm. Using the same word to describe both, but the acorn, in and of itself, properly nourished in the ground, etc., becomes the tree. But the egg, in and of itself, doesn't become the person unless something else is added to it. That's point. right. That's right. Um, you're right. So that's that's talking about um, uh, nature and the the matter and privation in in two different ways. Uh, one way with respect to the with the acorn becoming a tree, the form is already the form is here. The form is already there. The form is at work. The form is this active principle that is at work bringing the acorn to full maturity. All right, and we can look at that the same down here with the with with the human person. Um, uh, here, the human, the, the the form of the human person is already present. In in a sense, that it's already present, but um, but it is an active principle which brings something to full maturity. So, if we're talking about um, the egg and the sperm, it's different because in order to uh, to bring that to bring the form of a person, there needs to be some moving cause. Um, hey John, if you um, substituted egg and sperm with zygote, mm -hmm. would that solve the issue? Because the zygote would be like an acorn kind of? Um, is it's already fertilized, you know what I mean? That, right. So, so I think that that would, um, yeah, that would you know bring us back to here within within this this fact of the form is already here, um, and that would that would make it that would make it like this. That would mean the form is there, but it is um, being brought to full maturity. Um, uh, so, uh, an important distinction then here is that uh, it is not in the nature of an egg. To become a person, it is not in the nature of sperm to become a person, but together, uh, together they form the matter which can be in potency to a person. All right. Of course, they now they need some. Uh, Aristotle would say they need some moving cause um, in order to bring that about. <clears throat> Oh, Jerry, I think you're muted here. You're making them analogous when you're talking about the, an acorn or some other seed of some part. I'm, I'm not good on botany, but crystal and stamen that, that, that have to be fertilized in order to come up with the seed? Um, uh, yes. Are you, are you looking at something analogous in, in the plant? That would be like the egg. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm struggling with the potency and potential that being used both with respect to the acorn and to the separate egg and sperm. So I'm, I'm trying to. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
the 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 point here is that the oops sorry about that let me bring my thing back here if we were doing the principles of nature and we were talking about the the oak tree um mm -hmm. what would be the matter uh, well, the matter is the the kind of wood and the leaves and uh, the the kind of material that the the acorn and the tree are made of. So the form, uh, the form is is an immaterial thing, uh, which makes that matter to be that kind of thing. All right, so. Um, a, uh, a good analogy for the form, I think, is, is to use a man-made thing, using a statue. Aristotle uses this um, example all the time. So if you have a statue, say, made of bronze, Aristotle's favorite example again, uh, the matter for that statue as an artifact is the bronze. The form would be the shape that is brought to it. And now the form itself is, is an immaterial thing, um, but it needs a certain kind of material in order to, to be that thing. Now, and bringing that to nature, um, if we look at a person, then the, the matter is the kind of, of flesh and bones that a person is made of person is the kind of flesh and bones and elements and, and everything, uh, everything there, the form is what causes those things to be, to hold, to hold them together, to hold an identity together as a person, uh, as one thing it gives them unity. Um, so that principle of their coming to be gives them, give, gives that matter its unity. It doesn't have that unity when it is in privation of that form, which is the case with egg and sperm. Um, so this, when it's at the stage of the, of just being separate egg and sperm, then um, uh, it is not a person yet. It's still in privation of that form. It doesn't have that unity. Let's take a look at the four causes. Uh, Aristotle divides up the causes into internal causes and external causes. So we've been talking about the formal cause and uh, the material cause especially. All right, so the formal cause is um, uh, like the, the form of an independent thing if it's a substantial form. So for a human person, this is the soul. Uh, Aquinas argues the substantial form for a human person is the soul. An accidental form is something having some quality. So uh, my um, being bearded is an accidental form. All right. So uh, so that can change. But accidental forms have a dependent existence on substances. You can't have an accidental form just just floating right, by itself. It needs a substance. Okay, the material cause for a human, the flesh, bones, or other organic parts that are suitable for, your, for a human being. Okay, matter is relative to the form under consideration. It also has a form in its own right. So, for instance, if we're talking about a person, um, the, the bones are matter with respect to me. But if you just look at the bone by itself, it also has its own form, which is made of other matter, you know, calcium or whatever other elements are going to be in that, in that uh, bone. And then you can even look at that. You can look at the calcium and that is a formed thing. Those atoms are a formed thing uh, with their own matter. And you can go on, um, theoretically, uh, ad infinitum, um, uh, there could never be a basic 
there can never be a basic fundamental stuff um, that, uh, that you can appeal to. Anything that is material has matter and form. There's no just floating matter that's unformed. You can't look in your closet and find a chunk of um, prime unformed matter. If you do, let me know. Uh, that would be really interesting. Okay, so, so then we have these different levels of coarse grading. The same matter, you can, you can look at it as being a heart, or you can look at it as being cells. So numerically, it's the same stuff, it's the same chunk, but um, you can talk about it in, in different aspects. <clears throat> now parts, still under material cause here, so parts, as in organic parts, say, of a human being, they do not have independent existence. You can think of them in that way and they can be separated physically, but insofar as a heart is a human heart, um, then it, is, it has dependent existence. It is always the heart of some animal. Okay, so those are our internal causes. External causes, we look at an efficient or moving cause. So an example of this for, human, for a human person would be the parents. But you can also look at proximate and remote efficient causes. So um, grandparents and great grandparents and, and so on, all the way back, would be more remote efficient causes. Uh, if I'm causing a ball to move, if I kick a ball, then I'm the efficient cause of that ball's motion. And in that sense, I would say that um, that motion of the ball is not caused by nature, by the ball's nature, uh, but it is a natural motion for me to kick a ball. It's a natural thing for me to do, but it's not natural for a ball to suddenly go flying. Or it's not in the nature of a ball um, uh, in, in its own nature. I guess we should, we should pick something... Uh, a, a natural thing, say a rock. It's not in the nature of a rock to be kicked. That's per accident that it, that it is kicked. Okay, a final cause. So if you heard the word teleology, this has to do with final causality. Um, and if we, if we think again about nature drawing something towards a uh, completed uh, form, drawing it towards, a, um, towards maturity, or when it's reached maturity, you know, like we've talked about with, the, with a person being healed, that kind of maintenance and that constant activity, nature isn't a static thing. The form doesn't operate in a static way, even though we think of the form as a steady thing. Um, the, the nature of something operates in an active way uh, to, to maintain itself, really. Uh, and we can think of this in, in two ways. We can think of the final cause of the generation of something. Like the final cause of generation is to bring that form into actuality in that matter. But the final cause of a being, for instance, for a human, is the example I've used in the parentheses through this page. Final cause of the being is to know God for a human being. Um, Aristotle uh, will identify really the form of the thing itself as the final cause of it. Aquinas will uh, build, on, build on Aristotle plus the, the Catholic faith to show that everything has its destiny in God, its origin and destiny in God. So among these causes, which ones does modern empirical science study primarily? Material. Okay, definitely material. Yep, and there's one other. Um, efficient with physics, things like that. Exactly. Material and efficient causes are uh, the ones that modern science tends to study. And we'll look a little bit more about that later. Uh, so motion, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this page for a moment and come back to it if we need to. But I want to get on to our reading about Zeno on time 
and motion. So Zeno's famous paradoxes, which are designed to show that motion is impossible. And what do you think here? <clears throat> What kind of what you think here? You have to suspend reality in order to say motion is impossible. All right. Well, that uh, that's a, a a lot of philosophers have actually responded to it that way. Um, but Zeno wouldn't be very impressed because he would simply say, along with Parmenides, that what we observe is illusory. Um, so, and he would use this argument. Uh, he would say, like the with uh, Achilles and the tortoise. Let's see. Um, he would use this argument to say that that even though it seems like there's motion, there's there really can't be. So here's Achilles. All right. Here's the the tortoise up ahead. <laughs> All right. Here's the the finish line. So the argument is that. By the time Achilles gets to here, the tortoise has moved to here, right? But then by the time Achilles gets to here, the tortoise has moved to here, all right? That's one. The other one is just to say, if you're right here and you want to go to here, um, you have to go halfway. But in order to get to there, you have to go halfway. How, how do you make a motion? How do you make an argument there's no motion by saying a person moves from here to there? Uh, well, yeah, let me let me let me finish going through this one and I'll and I'll show where where he gets to that. So he says that to go from here to here, you have to go halfway, right? But to go from to get halfway, you have to go halfway to there, and so on. You have to always travel. And Zeno's argument here is you have to cover an infinite number of points mm. in order to get over to here. And he says, it's impossible to cover an infinite number of locations. So um, therefore, Z motion- Then Zeno possible. never went anywhere. He never moved. Well, that, again, that, that is not going to impress Zeno very much. So what, what can we, what is, what is his actual error here? Something about the premise being false, right? That time is composed of nows. I didn't really get that. Okay. Um, right. So, so what what does that mean? Anybody? Anybody? Any ideas what that might mean about now? What is yeah, now? The, the now is a thing that you can separate out and identify and put it there, as opposed to something that just is a point on a line. It doesn't really exist. It's just you saying there it is. Right, so if we look again. And this, is, this is sort of like Augustine. Everybody knows what time is until you ask them to tell them what it is. So if we, if, if we divide a line, if we get this point on the line, uh, that point doesn't have, it, it doesn't have material existence, that point on the line. All right, if we, if we posit something that has material existence right here, then it actually has magnitude and then it's, it's not an infinitely small point. Um, but if it is a point, any point has zero magnitude, all right? So if, if you want to say that, um, that a length from here to here has a magnitude, how many points is it going to take to get from here. Uh, let's see, here's another point, here's another point, here's another one. If we add all these up, no matter how many we have there, it's going to be zero. So what this shows is that time, like the point on the line, time is not composed of indivisible moments. Um, so another, another thing that, that is, you know, talks about that I think is, is good to show this is the arrow paradox, okay? So you shoot an arrow. Um, here's your target over here. All right, and he looks at it in a snapshot like this, and he says, well, you'll have to have infinitely many 
of those snapshots to get there, but that's impossible. But his, again, uh, like Gina said, his, his problem here is that uh, an arrow or that time is not composed of infinitely many points, but that point is an abstraction, just like this point on a line. If I say that is an actual point and it has no magnitude, it's an abstraction. It's not a thing in reality. So snapshots of time are not, are not real things. It's a way that we abstract, uh, that, we take, that we take something out of its actual um, real material existence and, and look at it in a particular way that it doesn't exist. I would suggest that the rebuttal you just made to Zeno is the same as saying, and Zeno can't move from here to there. He's abstracted in, in reality as you can move from here to there. Um, I, do, I don't quite follow you. Before, before oh, when I said on movement, Zeno goes from A, point A to B. That shows that movement exists. His abstractions contradict reality. I think that's the same thing you just said. Yes. Um, yes, you're right. But uh, that doesn't satisfy Zeno, though. That's right. It doesn't satisfy Zeno. Um, uh, and he didn't have the benefit of being able to read Aristotle. Um, so, uh, so that would that basically he was going from from a pure from a pure rationalist point not accepting that what is encountered in the senses is true, but just, just this pure, uh, just, just pure reasoning. And um, uh, one of the things that Aristotle often does is begin his discussions by reviewing the opinions of his predecessors, showing where they went wrong and showing where they were right. And um, if what you do is what Zeno do, does, then I, you don't eat. You know, there's a lot of things you don't do as a human being because they're illusions. Uh, yes, that's, Zeno would, would agree with that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Let's, uh, so we've talked about some basic principles in philosophy of nature. Now, metaphysics. Um, uh, before I'm going to see if I can get by with skipping the Porphyrian tree for now, and uh, let's go on to discuss this excerpt from Aristotle's Metaphysics. Okay, this is the one that's called the Study of Being as Being. So, what uh, what makes metaphysics different from the other sciences, or what do all the sciences have in common? That's another way to start thinking about it. Do they all investigate being in some way? Exactly, exactly. So uh, all the sciences have in common that they, in, they study being. The particular sciences, have uh, what differentiates them is that they study being under some particular, they study some particular kind of being, okay? So philosophy of nature, Aristotle would say, <clears throat> studies uh, being in motion, all right? Uh, the, the study, the science of mathematics would study, um, uh, would, would study pure forms that are found in nature that, that don't have the notion of matter included in them, like triangles or numbers. Okay, you need matter for triangles and numbers to exist, uh, for an actual triangle to be, um, but mathematics studies them in, in this particular way. And then the other sciences, like say astronomy uh, or biology, you know, they they they're a little bit more specified, or they take some sort of combination of those. Uh, but what sets metaphysics apart? It studies being as being, being as being. That's right. So, 
to, to understand what he's getting at here, what are, what are some different ways that you can think of where the word is applies in different ways? This is Bill Clinton's question, right? That's, that's right. We can, exactly. Um, uh, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton's uh, question about, or statement about that it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is, uh, is a perfectly legitimate uh, uh, notion in the context of a philosophy class. Um, i pretty sure he knew which uh, version of is he was, uh, was under consideration there, but it's, it's true. There are different ways of saying is. So what are, what are some of those ways that are different? Well, an equal sign, um, an equality, Mm -hmm. uh, two plus two is four is one example. That's right. So two plus two is four. What's another way of is that, that isn't the same as that? This is a um, food is healthy. Okay. Food is healthy. So there, we don't have an equation. We don't have an identity between food and health. Um, like we do with two plus two and four. Um, what's, uh, so, so healthy would be, would be an attribute of food. It would be a quality of food. So what's, we have that identity with math and we have a quality. What, what's a, what's another, another way? John is speaking. John is speaking. That's right. So um, that would be a, an activity being being predicated of me. Or how about um, uh, John is human, right? So that's not an identity. I'm not equal with humanity, like two plus two is equal to four. And it's not also just a quality that that I'm human. I I can't just suddenly lose the quality of being human. I hope. Um, so that's something that belongs to my essence. So there already we have three different ways of, of using the word is. Um, that something, uh, we have that mathematical identity. Then we have uh, a quality being predicated of me uh, or, or something, food is healthy. Let's go back to, uh, let's, let's put it on the same thing. So let's say, um, uh, let's say John is healthy or John is human. Those, the, the being of health and of human exist in me in different ways, right? The being human is part of that. That's part of my essence. That's not something I can lose. That's part of my being an independent thing, but the being of, uh, a quality or an accident, as Aristotle will call it, the being of an, of an accident is something that depends on another kind of being. Okay, so, so Aristotle's question is, how do we, what's the primary notion of being? And that is really what metaphysics is about, is looking at what, what, is, what is it that all these have in common? How can we call them all being? And what are the principles of, of that being? So in that sense, um, metaphysics becomes what we call an ontology, which is the study of being as itself. And then it also becomes a uh, natural theology because as we get to the principles of being, Aristotle will show that there is uh, one primary source really for this being. He doesn't quite come to that conclusion, but. Um, Aquinas finishes the argument for him in a certain way. <clears throat> uh, so let's look at another question here. How can healthy apply in different ways? For instance, I can say that food is healthy, exercise is healthy, the color of my face is healthy. So what, what do they have all have in common and how? So what's one notion yeah. that they have in common? They're all related to health in some way or another. All right, they're related to health. 
So that the, there's this elusive concept of health, right? But they're all related to that in some way. Um, and we can call completely different things healthy, but they're, but one of them might um, cause health. Uh, one of them uh, might be a sign of health, right? The color of my face might be a sign of health. Uh, and we call these, so you might, you might say that his, his face looks healthy, um, but that's different than when we say food is healthy as in something that causes health. So uh, again, this brings us back to the notion that with being, we're looking at a primary notion. We're looking at a primary one towards which all of the others point. <clears throat> okay. So let's look at the notion of substance, accidents, and essence here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so a substance for, for uh, Aristotle is an independent thing. And, and um, uh, some commentators have said that substance is not really the greatest term for this because the word substan substance um, literally means standing under, as in a substance is something that stands under whatever we predicate of it. But it's, it's actually the opposite. It's not that the things, it's not that it, um, it the, the notion of substance, the word substance seems to put the emphasis on the things that are predicated of it. But really the, the emphasis is on an independent thing, a thing in its own right that exists on its own the thing that persists through changes. Hey, John, is that by virtue of the English word or the Greek word? Um, well, that is, uh, it comes, that was the word that was chosen in the Middle Ages um, in Latin, substantia. Oh, okay. Uh, as, as the, basically the, the official translation of the Greek word, usia. Um, and, um, so, so yeah, that's where that, that's the history of that. Some modern translations have taken away um, the notion of, of substance and replaced it, or the word substance and replaced it with like thing, independent thing, or um, even use the word like thinghood. Uh, so for instance, a woman, a woman is a substance, a piece of wood is a substance. An angel is a substance as well, an immaterial substance. Uh, a flower is a substance. So what about a flower petal? What about a flower petal? Would that be a substance? Sure, as considered on its own, it would be a substance. Considered as part of the flower, I guess it wouldn't be. That's right. So a, a flower petal, um, insofar as it's a flower petal, uh, has dependent existence. So it's not a substance in its own right as far as it is a flower petal. If you detach it from the flower, then it becomes something else. Aristotle would say um, that uh, uh, it, be, it changes its, it basically becomes a different substance. Um, it's no longer something that, that has the same kind of dependent existence, but it has an independent existence. But uh, as long say, as it is attached to the flower, it has say, dependent existence. Did you just say transubstantiation? No, I didn't. So it was one <laughs> substance and becomes another. Um, uh, that's well. Let's let's put that off a bit uh, till later. We're going to come back to transubstantiation in the very last. Uh, in, in the very last class. So one substance can't become another. Um, uh, the, the issue of the Eucharist is an exception uh, among, among everything in existence for this, for this rule. Uh, the matter can become the matter for a different substance. And that's what happens with the flower petal when it's detached. The substance... Um, uh, we don't say the substance becomes something else, but the matter 
become something else. Um, uh, Aristotle, John. yes. Okay, so a, pl a flower plant, a, a, a begonia plant, mm -hmm. is a substance in itself. Yes. When you cut the flower off the plant to mm -hmm. put in a vase, that becomes a substance of itself. Um, I, I think that uh, we're, you know, we'd be getting into an, into an in-between area. I don't think we would want to, we would want to necessarily put a, a point, put a boundary on exactly when it becomes a different substance in that instance. Um, I think in the case of, say, the logs that you see here, Right. Uh, these have pretty clearly been just have have been killed, right? Um, a flower being cut and put into a jar like this, um, I think that Aristotle would say it is still the same substance, um, but that it 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 would it would die and deteriorate. And uh, but again, I don't think he would want to put a time, put a particular point on when it is no longer one substance, um, and that it's and it changes substance from a flower to a dead flower. Okay. So how about a table? Would a table be a substance? It would be an accident because it would be dependent upon some action from a substance. Okay. so. Uh, right, a table is not a substance insofar as it a table is it it is a table. It is made of substances. It's made of, for instance, the wood that this table is made of. That wood is a substance um, in its own right. But the table, the 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 art form, the artifact itself, insofar as as it is an artifact, that is an accidental form of the substance. Okay, so that brings us into accidents. An accident has dependent existence. It subsists as some aspect of a substance. So for instance, when we've been using the bronze statue example, the, the statue shape of the bronze is an accidental form. It still retains the, the substance of bronze when you formed it into, um, into a statue. So some examples of these that that Aristotle will, will use any quant quality, a quantity, for instance, a, a, a size of something, um, time, place, relation, action, passion. So uh, action is something I'm doing, I'm talking. Passion is um, something that is that happens to you. Um, again, if the rock is kicked, being kicked would be accidental. <clears throat> shape would be a kind of quality. So now uh, with substance, accidents, and nature, let's come to essence. This is going to be a somewhat convoluted way of putting it, but I'm going to look at the, the second statement here. Whatever something is said to be on account of being itself, or a principle by which something is active as and continues to be whatever it is. So let's break that down with the flower example, for instance. Uh, the flower is a flower. The essence of it is what it, what it continues to be. It's, 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 it's flowerness. Okay. Um, and uh, that only includes whatever aspects are necessary for it to continue being that thing. So if we, if we come to a man, all right, rationality is part of the essence of man. It's part of what, what it is for man to be. Um, baldness is not part of the essence of, of man. That's, uh, that would be an accident. That can change while the essence stays the same. So, so looking at that, which of the four causes seems most to be the essence?
The, the last one. Sorry, uh, let's go one at a time. Gina? Oh, is it final cause? Final cause. All right, any other ideas? Same answer I have. I mean, if, you, if you're looking at a statue, the thing that makes a statue isn't the block, it isn't the idea, it isn't the chiseling, it's the statue at the end. It's the final product. Um, could you go back to the slide with the causes on it, please? Yes. Thanks. Sorry. I'm back. I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was so far away. There we go. Thank you. <clears throat> well, isn't it a mater the material cause? The what makes what makes a, a person a person? Okay, is is um is what makes me a person? Is it the particular flesh and bones and organic parts I have? Well, it's it's that you got ten fingers and ten toes and two legs. Okay, so in in general, that 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 must be included somehow. But suppose I um I I throw I take all of those things and I throw them in a bucket. Then do I have a human? No. All right. So what do I need? What comes isn't of it's in essence more like formal cause? Exactly. Yeah. So so this is where we'll, we'll come to the essence is more like the formal cause because um, that is. Uh, that's the thing that stays steady when the the material aspects of the material can change. So I can. I, can I guess in terms of I guess the maybe we've come back to the question I had a little while ago because you can make a distinction between between essence and nature and in both of the definitions I think the thing that's in common is this is this idea of a principle and it's not something that is, uh, I guess in either case, whether we're talking essence or nature, we're really not talking about something that's physical. We're talking about uh, something that's, abs that's abstract. It kind of reminds me of Plato's theory of forms, mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I'm not sure I can. I thought that Aristotle had eventually dismissed Plato's theory of forms, but now this is this is sounding to me to be really similar. So um, there are some things that that Aristotle will take from from Plato, and and some things that he will correct. So the the idea of form he receives from Plato and accepts, and that is uh, that is really where we'll see for a natural thing where the the essence is is in the form but um you also for that natural thing to be the the form includes in its notion a kind of matter um, you don't have a disembodied form of a natural thing you don't have forms floating around but for it to come in into existence it must have um, what aquinas will call designated matter so particular matter this this matter right here um, so uh, there's not an independent form of humanity that's floating around somewhere that comes to an uh, that that comes to an inanimate body and makes it human. But the very act of the body coming into existence is uh, this composite of matter and form. Uh, but when we look at even though we need both of those matter and form in the composite to make the entity, the person, the being, um, the one that is more the nature, the one that is more the essence is the form because that is what, uh, that's the, the principle of identity that stays the same through, through any changes. Okay, so we were on substance. Let's go to actuality and potentiality now. I have a question and yes. 
and forgive me if this is like really dumb, but um, when we're talking about metaphysics and we're talking about forms and substance, like how are things like emotions addressed, like or or characteristics, like how is yellow addressed or how is anger addressed or can, are they addressed in this in this discussion or in metaphysics? So those in in terms of in, from a metaphysical point of view, we would say, what is their mode of being? Uh, and we would look at, are they, do they have being in, in an independent way in their own right or in a dependent way on something else? Um, so those, those would have being as a quality of some substance. So um, anger, Anger itself doesn't float around as a thing, but it's an aspect of a person. Um, yellowness doesn't float around, even though we think of it in an abstract way, apart from matter, we can think of yellow by itself. We can think of a, like a yellow patch, um, but it doesn't actually exist except in a substance, in a thing. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, actuality and potentiality. Let's look at a couple of examples here. Which of these do you think is the best example of full actuality? If we look at a fully constructed building, like here's the cabin I referred to earlier. So it's a static, but, but a complete thing. Or an activity like walking, an activity that starts and then goes on and then ends. So there's a definite beginning and an end to it. Or seeing, so a process where the process and the end or the purpose of doing it are one and the same. The doing and the having done are, are one and the same activity. Which do you think would be the best analogy for full actuality? Any ideas? <laughs> so Aristotle, Aristotle will say that seeing is the best, would be the best um, metaphor to use here for full actuality. So uh, he's looking at actuality as something dynamic, uh, something that, that keeps on going. It's in the process, it's been doing it, and it will, it continues to do it. So seeing is like that, you know, the, um, the activity, we've done it, and we're still doing it. It's going on. It's not, uh, so the lesser forms of actuality, you would say, would be something that starts and ends, or something that comes to a completion and just stays like that. Um, but uh, he's looking at actuality as a, as, as a, uh, a kind of dynamic thing. Um, so he'll say that actuality is always prior to potentiality. Now, what, what could that mean? So let's take, take a look, for example, at a person. If we take, um, uh, again, the, say the, the, um, uh, the, the egg and sperm that are in potency, to become a person, uh, how could it be that the actuality is prior to potentiality, even though they're in potency before they become in act as a person? Maybe because they have to exist first? Okay, they have to exist first, but they don't have that form yet. Mm -hmm. They don't have that form in act yet. So where would it be in act? Would it be right at the point of fertilization where it's completely, once it becomes fertilized, it becomes a poten you know, pot potentiality. So it, would it be right at the point before fertilization when it's, um, 
done doing what it's doing? Well, um, but even before that, we say that the, the, the egg and the sperm are right. If I say they're a potential, if they're a potential person, um, where where does that come from? Where where does the form exist in act before their potentiality? So Aristotle is saying the form exists in actuality before in potentiality. It's, it might be a little bit more obvious than than you think. Oh. Specific types of matter have the, I guess, the potentiality to be a lot of different things. That's so, right. So, the actual, the the goal, the telos, the form, where the material is actually going, uh, has to exist prior. Okay, and so where does it exist prior for a particular potential person? The parents. Exactly, in the parents. So for natural things, the form is uh, exists in actuality, or I'm sorry, in living things. Um, the form exists in actuality in the, the, the previous active instances of that thing, of, of the parents, um, or of the, the mature oak tree exists in actuality before the potential acorn, right? Um, so what we look at as pure potentiality is the material cause with respect to the form that it could be. So the sperm and the egg are pure potentiality with respect to um, that form of a person. But if matter is potentiality, and actuality must precede precede potentiality, then what must precede all matter? Actuality? Existence? That's right. Yeah, so there must be um, there must be a pure actuality that precedes all potentiality. And this is uh, so this is another, another way of getting to the notion of God, the notion, the, the notion of an, a necessary existent uh, that must be pure act, no potentiality in it, hence immaterial, which becomes the source in some way of, um, of all the other things. If we go back to uh let's see was it mm -hmm. this one um no oh, maybe it wasn't maybe it was here was that was that i'm looking for where we we're talking about uh, oh well well i'm gonna go back to um uh, ask a question john yes by saying that is what he's saying is is must be perceived must precede becoming. Say that again. Is another way of putting that is must precede becoming. Yes, being must precede becoming. Um, mm -hmm. You can't have a, a becoming come out of nowhere. All right. So, um, uh, uh, let's see. Let me go. I, I can't find where that thing is, but let me just share it to a whiteboard. I had a screen in, in one of the previous ones um, where uh, we had you know, the, the, the person perceiving you know, a flower. Uh, that's a flower, I guess. Um, and uh, we have the divine mind, right? So, or for, for Plato, this would have been the realm of forms. So in Plato's 
theory. Let me get another color for red for Plato, okay? So for Plato, um, the things themselves get their existence from the forms and we get our knowledge um, directly from, uh, directly by, by remembering the forms, okay? So we don't really get our knowledge by coming to know the thing, but the thing in a way reminds us of the form. Um, but uh, what Aquinas does is, um, is say that the forms are in the divine mind, in the mind of God. Okay, so everything gets its, its existence uh, from, from the mind of God uh, as the first actuality, uh, the origin of, of everything. Um, but we come to know them in, in this double movement. One is by our encounter with them, but also if you remember the agent intellect. All right, so you'll see this notion of the agent intellect, which we can revisit uh, if you want when we go, ba go back to the epistemology portion. Um, uh, okay. I'm gonna go back then to metaphysics. Okay. Um, All right, let's take a look at some aspects of modern science, the scientific method. So the scientific method is a, a mode of induction. It's a very uh, uh, highly structured and extremely powerful mode of induction for examining, as we said, material and efficient causality. Uh, an advantage of it is that it works no matter what your metaphysics is. So scientists with all different kinds of metaphysical theories can work with this because it just assumes uh, a kind of methodical materialism. It just looks for internal causes of, uh, of matter and efficient or moving causality within nature. That's just the, the nature of it. But some, some things to take note of down here with this um, the scientific method only proves conclusions with probability, which we know by the fact that uh, it that it is it that we often have to revise things that have been laws of nature, right? It doesn't talk about it doesn't uh, address or its methodology isn't set up to examine formal and final causality. Okay, then another thing which we'll get to in a minute more is the risk of scientism. If we put too much value on um, the kind of knowledge that we get through the scientific method, if we, if we think that that is um, the highest form of knowledge. All right, and then another aspect, which a lot of people still forget that it relies on intuition. If we're, if we're going to come up with a hypothesis there is uh, an intuitive element that must come up where we must come up with that, uh, that kind of getting an insight into the nature of things uh, mm -hmm. in a way that hasn't been made apparent yet. <clears throat> so let's look at some of the challenges in modern science to metaphysics. Uh, looking at a few of these, so positivism, you may have heard of logical positivism, that the only meaningful statements are those provable by experiment or logic. Then we would conclude from that, as the positivists did, that anything about religion, metaphysics, um, or spirituality is literally meaningless. Okay, naturalism, that nothing non-material exists. You'll see that there are some overlap with, with these. Um, Nihilism, the notion that the world is meaningless. 
various forms of reductionism. We can look at material reductionism where you would say everything is nothing but, if you just if you watch out for the phrase nothing but, for the, everything is nothing but elementary particles, everything is nothing but quantum fluctuations. Um, but no matter what you point to, that thing must be formed in some way. Again, we don't find any piles of unformed matter. Um, there is an immaterial form that's not explained by matter alone. Okay, biologism, you'll see this, every experience is just brain states. Psychologism, reason, truth, etc., are nothing but empirical actives of the psyche, the everything we, we think and, and believe and know is just kind of a mode of our psychology. All right, uh, a, con a common straw man argument, which is um, a straw man argument is, is one that sets up a, uh, a false, basically ascribes a false belief or a false position to your opponent and then argues against that. Uh, so modern philosophy will often accuse classical metaphysics of saying that it only cares about what's eternal and unchanging and therefore divorced from real life. Uh, but I, I think that this often comes from a failure of modern philosophy to engage with Aristotle and Aquinas in a serious way. Often what they criticize in classical as calling classical philosophy is really the result of um, modern philosophy from Descartes on. Okay, then we have other things that, other, different theories that come up that just kind of shake up our way of thinking about the world. And sometimes these become our, our, a challenge to, um, uh, to, to traditional metaphysics in different ways, or they may bolster it in some way, like the Big Bang. But um, these other things I've seen as all being things that uh, scientists or philosophers have used to try to argue against um, metaphysics uh, for, for a variety of reasons they it doesn't really work out but uh, what I think we should do at this point is um, just go to discussion and if we if you want to discuss any of these in particular then um, we can get to them or anything else from from today So questions, comments? Would um, existentialism come under nihilism? Uh, certain forms of existentialism would certainly come under nihilism. Um, if we're looking at uh, Nietzsche or, or Sartre, right. yeah, then, then I think that definitely leads us towards, uh, towards nihilism. Okay. Uh, there are some great, we'll, later when we're looking at modern philosophy, there are some great uh, Christian existentialists as well. Gabriel Marcel uh, mm -hmm. is, is a great example there. So there are some ways that ex existentialism can be integrated in with Catholic philosophy. <clears throat> but the destruction of meaning is not one of them. <clears throat> All right, any, any uh, questions, comments on philosophy of nature, metaphysics, the challenges from science? Let's take a look. Um, one more thing uh, would be the, the fourth reading that we had, probably the, probably maybe the most difficult. Um, I wanted to hear um, how other people were going to summarize uh, this reading, if, other, if anybody was willing to share, because I would be interested to see everybody's different approach to how to explain, um, you know, the existence of God in a nutshell. All right, that's great. So, um, so this, this short argument here, it comes in the process of a much larger argument, Aquinas uh, is making with regard to the essence of, 
of angels, basically. And he just kind of sticks in this argument um, to show that there must be uh, a necessary existent. Uh, but what can anybody kind of summarize this argument or or any of the steps, any of the key steps along the way? I'm not sure I can do it in steps, but it basically says in order for anything to exist, there has to be some being whose essence is existence to share that with others. That's basically it. Yeah. In order for, for any of the things that we actually come to know, in order for them to exist, they must get their existence from some, from something else. Um, and, uh, Aristotle, well, St. Thomas, uh, will, will argue that you can't then, you can't have a, an infinite regression of causes, mm -hmm. uh, because that would mean especially if we're talking about temporal things and we're talking about material things, that would mean that an infinite amount of time had already passed up to now, but we can't have a, an infinite amount of time already having passed. So um, you can't have an infinite regression. It must stop somewhere. And there, there's, there's the key, the key movement here. Um, but does, uh, do you, do you think that this would be an effective argument these days? Uh, if people take you honestly, it's a showstopper. Just how is it then that anything exists? And there is no other answer. All right. And any other, any other ideas? Um, I think that there are, plenty of very learned scientists who in a lab have either created the math and science possible for non-existence to, you know, predate a, you know, a big bang or a moment of creation. Um, or they just um, believe in the limitlessness of time and space and the universe. So, um, and if, if, everything in the universe can be explained through math or science, it's, you know, according to the people that hold these beliefs, it can be really hard to, to bring in evidence outside of their, their, their realm. Right. To, yeah. I used to read a lot of, I mean, I used to read a lot of the books by Neil deGrasse Tyson and, you know, summaries of, of Stephen Hawking. And, and for me, I had, it had the opposite effect. It, you know, made creation even more beautiful and made it make more sense to me. Um, but I know for other people, it, it justifies the, the non-existence of, of God. Um, yeah, I think, uh, so two points to be made here. One, if we're going back to, if we go back to the very first session, we were talking about uh, faith and reason, and um, if there are some things that, uh, if we can't, even if we can't necessarily prove an article of faith, uh, we can we can show that the contrary is not necessary. In other words, um, even if we're we don't need to go as far as proving the existence of God, we can um, we can show that. It's not necessary that these other theories hold. Um, now, then I, I think that maybe one of the best sources for the question of um, uh, what exists before the universe, um, I think that uh, probably the, the, the best explanation I've seen of that is from, um, uh, from Father Robert Spitzer. And uh, the basic point comes down to, you can't have something come from nothing. Nothing, right. Right. So no matter, in, and all of these scientists that, at least as far as I've seen, um, when they, what they mean by nothing isn't actually nothing. Um, mm -hmm. They say that there's, uh, it's a quantum field or it's, um, uh, it, it's a law of gravitation or something like that. There's always something that has to be there. 
um, that they call nothing, but it's not actually nothing. So um, I think that's the that's that's the biggest problem with with that argument. Well, that, well, that's yeah, that's the best way. If you go into form, then Father Spitzer's first uh, session in the um, his Cosmos series talks about that. You know, nothing can come from nothing. Nothing, nothing comes from nothing. Can't come from something. And um, he lays that all out. And then, then you run into the um, the anthropo anthropo anth anthropic coincidences. Uh, Stephen Barr spends a lot of time on this, basically showing, you know, some scientists say, well, it was just a coincidence that everything sort of came together. And um, Barr argued, and um, I mean, even, um, even Francis uh, Collins, the, um, the guy that runs the um, um, Institute, of, National Institute of Science, he argued the same thing. He said that the probability of that happening in the, is so, so tiny, small that um, it's not plausible. And of course, the, the, the purists say, well, nothing is not plausible, um, even though it's, and, and then you have the, multi, the multiverses, you know, multiple universes and all that stuff. Um, and again, the probability of that happening is so small that it's not plausible. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of theories out there, but they all go back to what you just said that, um, you know, with with the Big Bang, everything everything formed in one place, and that's when and and when you talk about time, that's time zero. So that has to put God out, or somebody has to put somebody outside of time, in order to cause that to happen. Yeah, I think the it I. I'm sometimes fascinated by the multiverse theories and the, the like bouncing universe theories. In yep. other words, that our, that our big bang wasn't the actual beginning, but it came after a big crunch of a previous universe, but it just, it just moves the problem back. It just means that the universe actually didn't start when we thought it did. Um, number one, but number two, um, we, we can't, there's absolutely no possible way to prove the existence of um, uh, of another universe or of a previous universe, of a bouncing universe, it can be a theory. Um, but uh, uh, I think uh, so. I, I think that that these arguments are are um, are very good. But what 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 do you think? I mean, as far as proving the existence of God to somebody, can, can an argument do it? You're usually talking to people who don't care if an argument can do it. They've already reached a conclusion. So um, I think that if we're going back to... Um, and that's the main purpose of some of these theories you're talking about is to say, well, sure it is. But there are other explanations that could be out there that are just as, who knows? You know, just throwing it up and saying, as, as Obama would say, beyond my paper. Uh, so if, if we're looking at, again, we're looking at metaphysics and the different ways of being. Many of the different, many of the ways that we come to know being, and we, we looked at this in earlier sessions, we come, we start with things that we know well, and we come to the things that are, that are further from our immediate um, experience, right? Uh, and the, the things that we often think about in, in science, we can, we can set them apart. We can set, set ourselves away from them. We can set, set ourselves at a distance from them and examine them. But being itself, is not something that we can separate ourselves from. It always permeates us. And this is the struggle with uh, trying to investigate being as being because we can never extricate ourselves from it. And this is where um, going back to the, the idea of, of the existentialists, I think this is one of the value of that the Christian existentialists, even starting with Kierkegaard, 
um, up to the present, what they show us is that when it comes to the most important things, when it comes to uh, God and morality, things that we really cannot separate ourselves from and examine ourselves a part of, because being itself is, uh, we, we, can't, we can't set ourselves away from it. Part of the argument is, is living it, is being it, is doing it. Uh, one, of the, one of the great examples of this, I think, if we're going back to Plato, when he, in, uh, in the dialogue, the Phaedo, which, is, which recounts Socrates' very last hours, the, um, the main argument there in the Phaedo that Socrates makes is for the immortality of the soul. And uh, Gabriel Marcel makes, makes the argument that uh, the, the, main, uh, the main argument that, that Socrates makes in favor of the immortality of the soul is not the dialectical arguments, not the actual back and forth of the conversation. That's not the main part of it, but the living of it. And this is where we come to metaphysics as something it is it is a topic with a subject matter that's very abstract but on the other hand it is a subject matter that is very much a part of our life that it's god in whom we live and move and have our being um, and at the end of aristotle's metaphysics where he arrives at the notion of a prime unmoved mover um, have the benefit of revelation, but it's there that Aquinas picks up the baton um, and and carries it forward. Uh, so, uh, uh, all right. Well, I hope this has been a good uh, introduction to some of the concepts of. Uh, of metaphysics, some of these concepts that we're going to return to. Um, I know it's probably seemed rather abstract and disconnected. Uh, unfortunately, that's just a necessity of the fact that we have so very little time to cover it. But I think as you read more and you start to encounter these terms and look carefully at how Aquinas is going to use them. And now we'll start to read more Aquinas, especially when we learn next week how to read the Summa, that you will, um, uh, you will come to a, a better understanding of them. So any, any final questions before we, before we close it out? All right. Yeah. Well, um, I will, uh, uh, hopefully process this, this video successfully tomorrow and get it posted um, for, for anybody who wants to review any part of it again. And I'll send out some more readings, which I promise will not be as um, difficult or abstract as the ones that we looked at today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good class. Good class. Yeah. Thanks, John.